this week on the Back Table Podcast. While relationships between physicians and industry, they can have many positive effects, these relationships nevertheless do create a risk of bias, and that must be mitigated to support the integrity of research. And you know, this work that we've presented, I think, suggests that financial disclosures are prevalent in IR, and they're often underreported, especially for top-sided image-guided uh, procedure research. And I think as a community, our collective efforts are necessary to uh, better understand, um, you know, the, the relevance, the prevalence of the problem, and then to also how, what are the effective ways that we can employ and how do we encourage disclosure and reduce bias. So it's definitely going to take a village to, to achieve that goal. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Before we dive into our topic today, just want to say a quick word from our sponsor, RadPad. RadPad radiation protection products developed by physicians for physicians and clinically proven to protect during CINE and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your health on anything less. Trust RadPad protection for all your interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com to learn more about radiation safety CME credits for you and your team. This is Dr. Ali Behetti and Dr. Mike Barazza as your host this week. We're very excited to introduce our special guest, Dr. Mina Makri from The Ohio State University. Mina, thank you for being our guest today. Thank you so much, Ali and Mike and Aaron and the Backtable family. Uh, it's always a real pleasure coming here, and uh, I'm a huge fan of the podcast, and it's certainly a huge honor to be a contributor today. So thank you again. Oh, yeah, I noticed you said The Ohio State University, so <laughs> hats off to you for that. I'm, I'm sure that Mina appreciates that. Very yes, much. I've, I've been sufficiently indoctrinated into Ohio State culture. <laughs> I know. So, you know, for our listeners, uh, we recorded with Mina. How long ago was that? You know, probably a year, year and a half ago? A couple of years ago, that's right. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, we we're talking about radiation safety and protection. And, and since then, I've been trying to make a trip up to, to come watch a football game with them. But, you know, as I share with these guys, pandemics get in the way. Um, but, you know, at least we have podcasts for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, our, our topic today is your, your recent article published in the October issue of JVIR about conflicts of interest in image-guided procedure research. It's a really interesting topic, and it has wide implications for our field. So give us a little bit of background. What constitutes a conflict of interest? Absolutely. So a conflict of interest is basically any situation in which a person is in a position to uh, derive personal benefit uh, from actions or decisions uh, made in their official capacity. So in this case, it would be from the research or their position and uh, anything can, can influence that. So uh, whether it's financial or other uh, sorts of uh, uh, relationships. I see. I see. So how did you come up with the premise for this research? So basically, you know, the current status of conflict of interest disclosures uh, in IR is uh, not well defined. And uh, we, so we wanted to explore the debate on uh, how to weed out bias without stifling innovation. So this was the first study to directly evaluate the level of agreement between disclosed financial relationships and uh, open payment data for top-sided image-guided procedures in the United States. In the past, the research has shown that over 80% of U.S. physicians have uh, financial relationships with industry. And this is all comers, not specific to IR. We, don't, we did not have that data until this study. And studies have also found that 43% to 69% of research publications and 11% of guideline panels fail to disclose those conflicts of interest. So to me, this was a particularly interesting topic, especially for our specialty, because collaboration with industry has been critical since the early days of IR when Charles Dodder and Bill Cook partnered together to uh, create the first IR catheters and devices. And, you know, even other pioneers and many more, you know, after that, Roche and Cope and Gunther and many others. So it is important, uh, but we wanted to explore that relationship and lay the foundation of how uh, to mitigate any risk of bias. And I'm really careful how I describe it because two things, you know, disclosing uh, a disclosure mitigates, but it doesn't necessarily eliminate the risk of bias. And I'm describing it as risk because uh, conversely, um, not declaring a disclosure doesn't mean also automatically that someone is uh, biased or, or there's a bias there. It's just a risk or even perception in some cases of bias. 
Mina, for these disclosures, are, are these dis, you know, are these enforced at all, or is it just kind of like a golden rule thing? You're supposed to disclose uh, any potential conflicts of interest. So they're not really. That's a really good point. They're not really uh, enforced. A lot of you know, most journals require that uh, authors submit their disclosures, but it's basically uh, based on their own self disclosure. So there's nobody confirming is this true. And even if they are disclosing, are disclosing everything or not, but so there's no reinforcement and uh, we can talk uh, about what things we can do to address that. Absolutely. So could you walk me through your study design? Yes. So th the, the purpose of our study was twofold. Uh, number one, we wanted to assess the prevalence of uh, conflicts of interest uh, disclosures in the U in U.S. based IR research. And number two, we wanted to also assess the level of agreement between disclosed financial relationships and open payment data for, again, top-sided image-guided procedure research, kind of alluding to what Mike was referring to in terms of, even if you disclosed, how accurate or how complete uh, disclosures are. Um, so what we did is we looked at one year worth of data in GVIR, the flagship journal of our specialty, and uh, we used that to estimate the prevalence of, of conflict of interest disclosures in IR. So we looked at all the authors, we uh, recorded, you know, the disclosures that uh, they disclosed. And uh, we obviously stratified that based on publication subtype and category and, and whether the articles were device focused or other type of research and so on. Uh, so that was the first part. The second part of this uh, study was uh, we also searched the uh, Web of Science database uh, for the top uh, 10 most cited studies of uh, the 10 most common image guided procedures in IR. Uh, with available U.S. Uh, physician payment data uh, of all of all time beyond 2013, where when CMS had the Open uh, Sunshine Act, where we have access to that public information, and um, the payments were comp compared with the disclosed financial conflict of interest, and we used a one-way uh, ANOVA to to do that. And the most, you know, if you're curious, the ten common procedures we looked at were. Radioembolization, chemoembolization, UFEs, PAEs, stroke thrombectomy, IVC filters, vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, tumor ablation, TIPS, uh, PAD uh, interventions. Uh, and these were based on SIR's common eye procedure uh, publication. And we were conservative too. So we, we looked obviously at uh, consulting type fees, but we excluded payments related to food, beverage, travel, lodging, education, because Many folks, you know, attend the sponsored presentation at SIR, you know, at, at lunch or something, and they may forget to disclose it. And uh, while these were show, have been shown to influence behaviors, we wanted to avoid f falsely you know, inflating any potential discrepancies. We wanted to be fair and accurate as much as we can, especially because these smaller things don't really constitute a long-lasting relationship between an individual and the industry and less likely to have uh, effects on research. But this is kind of, in a nutshell, our big picture uh, design. So what were the key results of your study? So the, the key results here were, in terms of prevalence, we found that disclosures were present in 29% of the publications that we looked at in, in that one year. And um, if you stratify, uh, they were most prevalent in the standards of practice papers. There were 50% of those papers had disclosures and uh, also very prevalent in the device-focused publications, 54% uh, compared to that 29 in overall cohort. So they're, they're very prevalent. And then in the second part where we looked at the, the comparison between disclosed and uh, actual or, or what's available on the open payment system, this is what was one of the most interesting findings basically was that among the 396 uh, authors of the 100 US uh, top-based top-sided, uh, image-based uh, procedure publications, we found that 97% failed to disclose at least one active financial relationship. Wow. Exactly. And this is active, not historical, meaning that relationship within the last year versus that's how we looked at it because you could have a relationship over a year ago from 20 years ago, and people might forget this is active uh, relationships. And that kind of corresponded to an average of almost $58,000 in undisclosed payments per publication. Wow. Per publication. Per publication. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> the same reaction yeah. we, we found. <laughs> and, you know, when you compare with previous studies in other areas of the healthcare system, 
discrepancies have been reported before for you know approximately in 43 to 69 percent of publications uh, so definitely in in, in ir uh, it, it's higher than the average and together both of these trends you know suggest that number one the conflicts of interest are prevalent in, in ir like other areas of healthcare and uh, conf conflicts of interest in top-sided image-guided procedure research are often underrepresented uh, in disclosure. So it's definitely a very eye-opening uh, finding. Mina, what form did most of these payments take uh, for the individual authors? We break it down, but mostly consulting fees because right. we've, we've excluded mm -hmm. all the smaller things we talked about, like food, lodging, smaller amounts. So these were, were for uh, consulting fees. And um, if you uh, look at the numbers here, I can, yeah. So just going back to this, uh, on average, authors received 103,000 uh, in active payments per publication, if you look at it. And for those who disclosed, they've kind of disclosed approximately 46,000. So that's where we got the 58,000 uh, number. Uh, wow. So it's incomplete disclosures, yeah. Is it too late for me to file a complaint for any of the things that I have published? Because I did not get <laughs> $100,000 for any of my publications. Um, yeah, so uh, these can be submitted retrospectively for uh, for consulting fees. I, I did notice that you've, you've been uh, very specific about your nomenclature. So the first part of your study was just JVIR publications, and the second part is looking at image-guided publications. So under, Im under the umbrella of image-guided publications, did you get a sense of how many of those authors were interventional radiologists? So the majority, the overwhelming majority were interventional radiologists because we looked at the top 10 uh, interventional procedures. But obviously, you know, a lot of times you're working in interdisciplinary teams. And the other thing that we looked at was we only looked at, uh, like I said, U.S. physicians because we don't have open payment data. So if that group had international physicians, we can't look at their numbers. And like I said, after 2013, when that data was published, so before that, we don't know. But um, it's mostly interventional radiologists. I did find it interesting that uh, in reading your article, TIPS was the procedure that had the least complete disclosures and TACE had the most complete. I would have thought just off the bat that something where there's a much heavier industry presence, like PAD, for example, would have had the least complete disclosures. Can you help me maybe some thoughts about why that could be? Yeah, it, it is really, you know, we don't really know why, but um, I, I've noticed that too. And, and, you know, and I'm not sure, you know, I'm hypothesizing maybe because uh, tips became more popular earlier on and maybe there was lack of information or lack of uh, approaches to, you know, those kind of things and how to disclose. And then over time, um, you know, those authors were less likely to disclose, but it's really hard to, to, to um, generalize. And these are correlations, not causation. So it's, I agree with you. It's, it's, um, it's interesting to see the micro, uh, not only just the macro patterns, but also the micro trends. Totally. I mean, you did actually see something though. And for um, the PAD studies, didn't you see, you know, a, a higher number of, of, I don't want to say, of financial relationships? Yes. Um, Said there was like a 4.6 disclosure depth discrepancy for PAD. Yes. So it, it is very high. And, you know, we, did, we didn't really want to, you know, go into why and we didn't really discuss the specific trends because it's really hard to, we, we don't know why sure. very much. And we didn't want to, you know, create, you know, overgeneralize or create conclusions. And remember, this is only based on one issue, you know, one year, one volume, sure. so one year of JVIR. So we don't have other journals. Well, I guess this is the, the, the correlation part. Like I said, there's limitations because we don't have the international, you know, physicians that were part of these and we're only looking at certain years. But I, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't have good answers for that question. <laughs> <laughs> I guess just that maybe what I'm trying to understand is, do you think a lot of, uh, a lot of the non-disclosure was purposeful uh, or do you think it was just like a lack of insight by filling out, a, filling out some paperwork on the JVIR website? You know, I, I think there is implicit and there sometimes there is also explicit bias. So, uh, you know, physicians may not always be uh, aware or maybe, you know, the top speakers who are getting paid by so many different uh, industry partners for their work, you know, that maybe it's hard to keep track for these things. Maybe there is also a time delay between when something is processed and when the publication got out. Uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of factors that get uh, that play at, at this. And, you know, just so you know, in terms of bias too, when we look at these things, uh, there's also, and it's more than financial, right? There is, you know, institutional allegiances, uh, alliances, there is prospects of fame, opportunities for career advancement. So there's other forms of biases that can cause, uh, that can contribute in addition to the financial disclosures. But I think one of the things that we argue for is that we need a open global registry, uh, just like the open payment CMS database that not only has all this information and is comprehensive, but we want it to be automatic. So it doesn't rely on an individual author to keep track of all their disclosures, to present all of them and for every publication, all the kind of stuff. It takes away that human error, human factor, whether it's implicit or explicit. Okay. So for an average community practice IR, what are the implications of the high level of non-disclosure of COIs for somebody in our position who might just read JVIR and uh, or look up these articles on image-guided procedures, what should we be on the lookout for? So um, findings from this work should absolutely raise the attention of interventional radiologists evaluating published data to this often invisible factor that creates a risk of bias, not necessarily bias, but there's a risk of bias. So for example, it is, uh, you know, previous studies have shown that those with uh, industry sponsorships are more likely to have pro-industry conclusions and interestingly, which I was interesting to me when I found this too, others also may be publishing conclusions that are inconsistent with the study results. Right. This has been shown in the literature. The other thing that industry sponsorships do is that they also erode academic freedom and influence research agendas because a lot of times, you know, companies will sponsor research that more aligned with their growth. I'm not saying that always happens, but it is in their best interest to do that. And uh, that inadvertently suppresses research that doesn't further the industry's objectives in science or in policy. So uh, this potential for bias is definitely the reason that expert consensus has emphasized the importance of disclosure to mitigate it and support data integrity. And anybody who's reading uh, any study should um, have in the back of their mind that information. And this is why journals try to disclose that. I mean, one thing I found really striking in the article was that it cited something that that suggested I think over 70% of interventional radiologists have an industry relationship of some sort. And that is much higher than I would have guessed. Me too. And and uh, we did expect to, to, that there's going to be a high uh, level of, of uh, relationship there. But it was just because, you know, disclo conflicts of interest are in general in healthcare are common. And especially for IR, like I alluded to, given our historical evolution as a specialty that relies on innovation and, and yeah. new devices and relationships. Uh, we did expect to see that, but it was really uh, interesting to see how high the prevalence and then obviously the, the, the discordance between the uh, disclosure as well. So, uh, so Mina, what are some of the limitations of this data set? So the, the limitations, uh, like I said, are number one is that this study uh, looks at one volume of one journal. So we're not looking at uh, a wider uh, level of information. Uh, number two is that um, we're only looking at 2013 and beyond. So uh, that's when the open CMS data was available. The other thing is that uh, disclosures also may vary over time and across. I already mentioned that. The other thing is that the delays between the uh, manuscript submission and publication and between payment reception and open data publication can also con can confound the data. So there's some some variation there. How did you determine uh, like relevance of a consulting fee in relation to the manuscript subject? So like, uh, for example, Dr. XYZ gets like $300,000 from Cook to research, I don't know, a new stent, but he writes a paper about another device that Cook doesn't even make? Well, you know, we didn't go into the weeds in terms of how... Like relevance of, of, the, of the COI? The COI should always be disclosed. Uh, the relevance sure. of it, you know, and the, we're talking about healthcare COIs, right? So if you have a relationship with a pharmaceutical or a medical company, you should disclose it. Whether you're being consulted by, you know, XYZ company for this device but you're promote, we're doing research on a separate device, there's going to be bias there or risk of bias there. So uh, we want it to be as comprehensive as we can. And, and the guidelines indicate that you should disclose all your relationships. You shouldn't be sherry picking. So 
we didn't really, the only thing that we looked at uh, when we looked at the data was uh, the type of, of not not the actual company, but we looked at the type of the, the funding that the, the, the physician received. So like I said, the food lodging type funding we excluded, but the consulting fees we include. Because if you include the food and the mm -hmm. lodging, uh, which is very common for any of those sponsored dinners or lunches or events at national meetings, we would have been 100%. It would have been everybody, <laughs> almost everybody's not disclosing. And, you know, you may be even attending some of these sponsored events and not knowing their, you know, industry or, or whatnot. So those are the smaller ones we excluded. But we did, once we got into consulting fees, the expectation is that everybody should disclose what they're getting funded for. We didn't go into the weeds because then that would introduce our own bias of, you know, including or not including. So we want it to be as streamlined and as comprehensive as we can. Absolutely. I, I think you touched on a really important point there is just how pervasive industry is in our field. I mean, even from our, your first exposure in IR um, as a medical student, you're you're meeting reps, you're making connections, um, and it's a bigger impact than than we all realize. Now, Mike, I don't know about your your experience, but I think that's one of the major ways that we can start doing new procedures in our community hospitals is, oh, you know, yeah. working with industry and trying to get them to help us take on these tasks. Totally. I mean, look, it, it is, uh, it's a necessary part of uh, our job in, in interventional radiology. We are very device heavy. We are a very versatile specialty and there's something new every week. And, you know, I, I don't know of another specialty that is as equipment or tech heavy as ours. And, you know, sometimes you need help just navigating that. And, and as you said, you know, with new procedures, you know, for some of these things, it, it can help to have support. You know, I, I lean on, uh, I lean on reps to different degrees, depending on what I'm doing. But I mean, sometimes they go as, as far as, as, you know, helping with practice building and it, it it's absolutely a challenge. Absolutely. And, and they're definitely a great resource and they're definitely, you know, partnership is healthy when it's done the right way uh, between us and them. And, and obviously, like I said, since the beginning of our specialty, it's been a good re symbiotic relationship. But it's, you know, how do you manage it in a healthy way to avoid, you know, crossing lines, whether it's implicit or explicit. So sometimes you don't even know, you know, you're being influenced by something. Or like I said, in the setting of research, you know, it is important because studies have shown that even smaller uh, relationships can have an impact. Uh, sure. And I'm sure these are all good people and they're not, they're not meaning to, to have that influence, but it does happen. <laughs> So I want to go back to the registry that you were talking about. So uh, help, just help me understand that a little bit more. So you want to create a registry where all IRs can uh, record their conflicts of interest, um, and that would be publicly available. How is that different than what exists currently? So the, the registry that is present right now is for CMS open data. So it's not global, so it's only for U.S. physicians and, and certain types of payments. But I think what would be better would be something that is more comprehensive in terms of global reach and relationships, but also that automatically integrated with the research part of it, right? So uh, CMS and the open data may be present, but it doesn't mean that people that are submitting the research or studies, they actually are disclosing these things. And this is what the discrepancy that we found. And the journals and, and, and other uh, area, you know, other institutions are not actively looking at this. So we want, what I think would be helpful would be having something like this where it's comprehensive, open, public, and automatic. So there's no burden on the actual researcher or physician to disclose anything because it's already done for him or her. And um, also would bring more transparency to the journals and everything else. Do you see a similar registry available for other procedural specialties? Yeah, I don't think it has to be IR specific. I think this could be even, that's why when we looked at our research, we called it image guided research, uh, procedural research, because it's not necessarily, even though we have, for us, it would be a huge help. I think uh, having as a broad in medicine or even, you know, just a physician industry relationship database. And I honestly think as a researcher, I would welcome that because there's a lot of paperwork you have to fill when you submit a paper or if you have to present and you have to, if you have relationships, actually it is kind of, it's nice. It would be nice <laughs> if that's done for you. I'm sure they make you resubmit it like in a different format. I'm, don't worry, they'll 
I'll find a way around that. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, you know, like I invite speakers to our institution and, you know, for events and things like that. And, you know, they have to, um, you know, fill all these disclosures and, and, and all this conflicts of interest. But if all this stuff is like automatically mm. in a standard database and you just print it out and share it and you don't have to worry about it, you know, it, it's just uh, in any of those presentations, you go to the meetings, you'll see, you know, the, the, the speakers always present their disclosures and it's mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of stuff. So. It's a lot of stuff that they yeah. present in one slide at the beginning, but they show for one second. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Mina, what what future directions of research uh, do you have regarding this topic? So, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of future work is necessary to uh, understand how to best encourage disclosure and reduce bias without stifling innovation, which is a hallmark of our specialty. Uh, this is this study is just the first step. This is the first study looking at this. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. And, um, you know, like I said, we need to look at broader to estimate the prevalence better. We need to look at a broader range of journals and over time and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. And then we also uh, need to investigate uh, effective tools. Uh, so this study was to kind of diagnose the problem or assess the current state of affairs. But we need to look at what tools, what disclosure methods would be easy to use, would be most effective, would be better than what we have right now. So there's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done. Excellent. In conclusion, what's your key message to the IR community? The key message, message is that uh, while relationships between physicians and industry, they can have many positive effects, these relationships nevertheless do create a risk of bias, and that must be mitigated to support the integrity of research. And, you know, this work that we've presented, I think, suggests that financial disclosures are prevalent in IR, and they're often underreported, especially for top-sided image-guided uh, procedure research. And I think as a community, our collective efforts are necessary to uh, better understand, um, you know, the, the relevance, the prevalence of the problem, and then to also how, what are the effective ways that we can employ and how do we encourage disclosure and reduce bias. So. It's definitely going to take a village to, to achieve that goal. All right. Mina, thank you for coming on the show. It was a pleasure talking to you today. What about me? It was, it was a pleasure talking to you too <laughs> as well, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you both. That was awesome. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Zubi Sayad, Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. And newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.